Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Susan Hudson from Texas Fertility Center with another episode of Fertility Docs Uncensored. I am here with my amazing, talented co-host, Dr. Abby Eblen from Nashville Fertility Center. Hey, everybody. And Dr. Carrie Bedient from Fertility Center of Las Vegas. Hi. How are y'all doing? <laughs> doing great. Good. Good. It is It is ending spring, beginning to be summer. Any any trips to going home where you grew up coming up? I grew up in Arizona. You do not go home during the summer. <laughs> like, <laughs> the only reason to go home during the summer is if you want to go to water parks because they're, they know how to do that. They know how to do that. But you also have to dump an entire bottle of sunscreen on your body throughout the course of the day so that you do not turn into a little crispy red onion. Um, so... That makes sense. That makes sense. Where did you grow up, Abby? You grew up in Tennessee, right? I grew up in the eastern part of Tennessee. And the really cool thing about that, TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority, which started in the 50s, dammed up a lot of lakes and rivers. And so we have lots of lakes and rivers around. And in fact, my hometown literally was on a lake, both Teleco Lake and Fort Loudon Lake. And so my sister has a boat. And so it's kind of fun to go back there and ride on her boat and go skiing and that sort of thing. So, so yeah, we'll probably make a few trips over there this summer. That's fun. That's fun. Anything unusual about like the places you grew up and things that made it unique? Well, we were talking about the good things and the bad things a minute ago. And one of the (laughs) cool things when I grew up, there was something called Foxfire up in the mountains, not exactly where I grew up, but in the foothills of the Smokies, I worked at a summer camp a few summers, Wesley Woods and probably two or three times a summer, we would see fox fire, which is th- phosphor, um, is fungus that glows, basically. It's, it, mm. it looks green kind of when you're walking along, and it's just so bizarre when it's pitch black outside and you're hiking along and you see this phosphorescent fungi glowing. So that's the cool thing, but we also have you know, a few snakes, but probably brown recluse spiders are the things that I that give me the heebie-jeebies the most you have to be kind of careful around here they say people in Tennessee there's two types people that don't know they have brown recluse spiders and people who do know they have them but we all have them because they just live around here so that's kind of our most kind of scary creature I think um, in the house and around the house what do you have Carrie I mean, it is standard practice. If you happen to leave shoes outdoors or in a like dark place where you haven't used them in a long time, you turn them upside down, you knock them out before you put them on because little little creepy crawlies, scorpions are the scary ones. Um, sometimes spider, but scorpions are the ones you want to avoid. And then like when you're h- hiking out in springtime especially, you never put your hands where you can't see them because um, rattlesnakes. Um, they, they blend right in and you can be super close to one and have Ooh. absolutely no idea that you are close to it until it starts its little rattle and making you aware of it. Have, have you ever heard that? Has that noise ever happened to you before? Oh yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, I, I, I mean, think I, Arizona and Texas have a lot in common. I mean, that's like, literally, yeah. I remember growing and you'd have shoes that you haven't worn for a while and you'd knock the heels and dump them out. Just make sure there wasn't anything in there. And <laughs> and the same thing on the rattlesnakes. I mean, my, my great aunt had a farm and I remember numerous times there, you know, we finding a snake and dad would go kill it. And of course my great aunt there, I, I don't know if they did this out in Arizona, but um, kind of the old wives tale was that if you hung a dead rattlesnake over a tree, that it would bring rain. So that would happen. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, uh, we definitely in the house that I grew up with, so we didn't have as many brown recluses, but we have black widow spiders. Oh, um, really? They're really, uh, they're unique in the sense that you can spot their webs because most spider webs are beautifully symmetrical. Like uh-huh. if you think about all the nature photos where they've mm-hmm, got yeah. a gorgeous yeah. web with the drops of dew on it. Yeah. Black widow spiders are the kind of housekeepers you would expect widows to be, uh, <laughs> totally disorganized. Their webs are very asymmetrical. And when you look at them on them, they're really a beautiful spider because they are just pitch black with this bright red hourglass on the bottom. Yeah. But um, 
but yeah, I never went near the hose head to, to turn it on because I, there was, there was a little family of black widows and no matter how many times we killed them, they would, Seriously? They would come back and there would be their egg pouches are incredibly sticky. And so Ew! You would see Ew, I this, don't like sticky. You would see <laughs> this like white, I don't know, one to two centimeter kind of like, cotton ball sort of thing like off-white cotton ball and um and you just move it smash the hell out of it like if it was in the house it was gone oh wow. i have to say i have like the icky goosebumps going on right now excellent my work here is done <laughs> <laughs> let's let's go into some questions let's go into some questions i'm changing the subject <laughs> All right. So one of our questions today is I am 30 and we've been trying to conceive for 10 months, no previous pregnancies or children around month six. I had an HSG that found left fallopian two was blocked in the middle. Right was found to be normal. We ended up going to a fertility clinic where we had all other tests and found that everything else was within average range, AMH, semen analysis, et cetera. The endocrinologist decided to do a bubbles test to see if my left tube was truly blocked and he was able to get a bubble to pass. His rec was for us to try ovulation induction to super ovulate meds and injectables. Would this be your rec? Would this truly enchance, increase the chance of multiples? For long-term family planning, would you recommend bypassing OI and going to IVF to financially afford it? But before anybody answers this question... <laughs> <laughs> Um, what we're really going to do is we are going to use this to kind of springboard into our talk today, which is all about tubal factor, when to choose IUI versus when to choose IVF, because that is a, a issue that a lot of our patients have. You may not know you have this problem if you're kind of new in your journey. If you already know um, that you have an issue, then you, this will be very helpful. But if you don't know, it, it may give you some ideas of, hey, we may, may need to check this out. So let's let's kind of start off on the, the basics of what, what are the different testing options we have when it comes to tubes? So the most common one, and the one probably our listeners are most familiar with, is called a hysterosalpingogram or HSG. That's a test that's done by the radiologist. Um, typically, we time, anytime we do these sorts of tests, we want to make sure that you're not pregnant. And so we time it, and we usually say day number one is usually the first full day you have a good flow, um, the morning of that day. And then we typically time it somewhere between day five and day 11. Depends a little bit on the length of your menstrual cycle, but we typically want you after your menstrual cycle but before we think you ovulate. And so anytime we do any kind of testing on your uterus, that's the timing for everything. Now there's two different tests. There's the HSG test, which is an x-ray test. That's a test done by the radiologist. Um, typically they put radio opaque, not radioactive dye, but radio opaque dye through your uterus. They can't really see the soft tissue of your uterus, but they can see where the dye goes, the hollow spaces. So they can see your cavity provided, you know, they're able to get a good view of your uterus, the way it lays within your pelvis. Um, and they can also look at your fallopian tubes and make sure the dye spills out. There's another test that we can do with ultrasound. Um, and not everybody does this, but we typically do this sometimes in our office. Our nurse practitioners do it called a saline sonogram. Um, it's probably the best for looking at the uterine cavity. And in fact, when people do IVF, we like to do that test because we can really see the cavity pretty well. Um, our nurse practitioners will also take air bubbles. And, and that may be what our list, one of our um, listeners was talking about in her question, put air bubbles through the tubes. And generally, if the tubes are open, you can see the air bubbles float through and float out into the peritoneal cavity. Um, but those are really kind of the two basic ways that we can look at the tubes outside of surgery. And that second test, um, if you're focusing on the uterus, it's a saline sonogram. If you're putting the bubbles in, it's a high mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so sometimes people have surgery and we can put dye through the fallopian tubes during surgery to see if they're open and healthy appearing as well. Now, kind of focusing on the fallopian tubes, what are some of the findings that we could find on one or both of these tests and why I, I can say that I'm, I'm definitely more of a fan of the HSG than the HICOSI, um, but kind of what, what are some of the findings we can find that will help us go along your treatment path? Let's talk about normal first. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so normal on an HSG is when you're looking at the tubes, you want to see little spaghetti noodles. And so you see these spaghetti noodles that come up from the side of the uterus, one on each side, and they, um, they will oftentimes get gradually bigger as you get closer to the end. They're a lot longer than anybody thinks they are. And then you see this dye spill out. And so what happens is when they're doing the HSG, they're taking a bunch of pictures. So this is not just one picture at the beginning, one picture at the end. They're getting a bunch of pictures as that dye goes through so they can watch it as it cracks. Because what they want to see is, do you get a full, complete spaghetti noodle? And then do you see the spill at the end where your dye is initially really concentrated when it's still just barely coming out? And then as, as it spills out further, you want to see it get lighter and lighter and fade out and, and go kind of all over the pelvis. So that's what a normal HSG looks like. A normal hycosi is something that your ultra, whoever's doing your ultrasound is going to be looking at at the same time as they're putting that, that special bubble solution in. And they're watching to see, are the bubbles tracking through the tubes and coming out the other side? So that's normal in both cases. And it's important to know what normal is so you know what abnormal is and which abnormals are really problematic and which abnormals are maybe less so. So Abby, what are some of the abnormal findings you can find? So let me just make one point before we go further. In my office, if you walk in and say you want a high seat, people will look at you like you have three heads. We don't use that terminology. There's nothing wrong with it, but we either say a saline sonogram with tubal patency or a saline sonogram without. And we put saline in no matter what. We don't use any kind of special solution. We just use saline. So, but bottom line is it looks at the tubes. And in terms of what we're really looking for, we're looking to see if the dye stops right where the tube connects. So that's called a corneal occlusion or corneal blockage. That's the region of the fallopian tube. It's the cornea. The other blockage is at the far end of the tube. And the medical term for that is a hydrosalpinx. And a hydrosalpinx is basically where fluid collects at the end of the tube. The tube is scarred shut. Uh, or if it's scarred shut, we tend to see a big collection of fluid there. And we've known for probably 25 years that if you have that collection of fluid there, that can be really problematic in terms of pregnancy outcome. Um, we know particularly with IVF that if you have that fluid collection there and you don't have that tube, something done to that tube, then it, it drops your success rate by about 40 to 50% with IVF. Mm -hmm. Carrie, what are some of the other findings you can find? So... In long standing with my um, ridiculous analogies, I am looking <laughs> at what kind of pasta types do you see on the HSG? So if spaghetti is your normal, um, when you see those hydrocalpinges, um, that's a sausage pasta. Like mm -hmm. that's a big old manicotti. You know, you've got <laughs> huge stuff. Stuffed manicotti. Ridiculous. You can see. Um, and sometimes you can even have hydrocell pinks that are patent. So not all yeah. hydrocell pinks are True, blocked, yeah, yeah. but you have, you have damage that has kind of stretched out the architecture of the fallopian yeah. tube and made it unhealthy. Probably not a good tube if it's a hydrocell pink, but some can be blocked and some are not. Yeah. Right. yeah. And, and actually it's the ones that aren't blocked that give most of us chest pain, um, mm -hmm compared to the ones that are blocked. But so you've got your hydrocalpinges, whether they're blocked or not. And those are the big manicotti, huge stuffed ones. You've got, um, uh, oh, S-I-N. Uh, Salpenditis ismica nodosa. nodosa. Thank you. I got the ismica nodosa and I was trying to come up I with I thought you were trying to think about the pasta though, that I was like, what kind of <laughs> pasta is she going to describe with S-I-N? <laughs> oh, oh, no, 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 no. I got the pasta. That's rotini. Oh, okay. Okay. It's rotini. That's <laughs> rotini. Um, oh, and so oh, that's- rotini is like the, the round curly the pasta. Yeah, those are the little spiral oh, ones. Because instead of seeing- I like that. Instead of seeing a real clear line all the way through, yeah, it's just like yeah. you've got all these jutting pieces into it from the top and the bottom. And um, and so that's that's no good for tubes. That that does not denote a good um, good way of going about it. Um, and, and why, Carrie, why, Carrie, would you say that's not a good tube? Why is S-I-N bad? So anytime that you're thinking about the tubes, there's two parts of tubal structure that, that we want to pay attention to. One is, is the tube open? That is something that you can very easily test on, on any of these tests. The other half of it is, does the internal architecture of the tube um, help your cause? Is it intact? And those are all the tiny little hairs that help push the egg and the sperm together. And then once they're together, they help push them down to the uterus. 
um, where there is nice nice big roomy uh, space for it to implant and start to grow. Well, anytime you have something that disturbs the internal architecture, that doesn't necessarily show up on tubal testing. And in fact, the vast majority of the time, it doesn't. And so seeing SIN is um, it is not terribly common. And it's kind of mm-hmm. nice to see it because it's a dead giveaway that, all right, this tube's not normal. Most of the time you just see the tubes open or not open. And so when we have something that indicates, okay, that internal structure may not be working as well. It's not just about do the egg and the sperm have the capacity to meet up and is the tube open? It's can they meet up and then be moved to the correct location? Because Everything has a time and a place. And in real estate, it's location, location, location. And where you have your first hookup is not where you are going to settle down and live as a family. Um, and that that is- I love Gary. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's that's true. Like you, you are not going to build a family in the backseat where you had your first encounter. You are going to get a nice space, house, apartment, condo, wherever- to build and expand your family. And that's not going to be in the middle of a tube. So if that internal architecture is damaged, the wheels are off the car, you can't necessarily get there. And that's really problematic. Okay. So when we're, when we're kind of, we we've established, you may have normal tubes or you may have abnormal tubes. Okay. And and for this talk, we're going to assume you have abnormal, either one or both tubes. Okay, because that's going to play into our decision making factor. So let's kind of start with the simple end. Okay, so what type of tubal findings do you think that it's reasonable with appropriate counseling to do something less invasive like IUI? So I think if you have at least one open tube, and I think I'll be interested to see what you guys say about salpingitis, ismica, no dose, or sin, you know, those patients you want to watch, um, sometimes we'll do an IUI, regardless of the side they ovulate on. Sometimes we go, well, why don't we try and at least decrease your chances a little bit and only do an insemination, take sperm, and really try and help you get pregnant when you ovulate on the side where we think your tube is better. Um, those patients we want to watch real closely. And when they do get pregnant, we want to bring them in really early to make sure that the Im- implantation occurs inside the uterus. Um, so really those are kind of the patients that I would say it's reasonable to try and get them pregnant with IUI, even though maybe their tubes are not perfect. So when we're talking about somebody getting pregnant with some sort of tubal factor, of course, whether or not you can even get pregnant is a big issue. But what's the what's the other thing that actually gets our stomach in knots that we're really, really worried about? You kind of mentioned it, but not directly. Ectopic pregnancies. Yes. And, and what is what is that? So ectopic just means not where it's supposed to be. And so the most people think of that in terms of tubal pregnancies, because that's, if you're going to be a pregnancy growing where you shouldn't be, the tube is the most likely place because uh, it's the laziest place to grow in the wrong location. You just, instead of keep walking, you can just plant right there and you start growing. Um, You can have ectopic pregnancies in other locations. You can see them on the, they can grow on the ovaries. They can grow on the tube uh, or excuse me, on the uterus. They can grow on the outside of the tubes. They can grow in some cases on the back or I I saw one that was up on the liver. That was horrifying. Um, But most of the time they're going to occur within the tube. And, and it's, it's exactly what we talked about before. I mean, it's, it's trying to grow a huge family in a teeny tiny little bathroom tub. (laughs) <laughs> just, there's not there's just not enough room it's not a bad place it serves its purpose for what it's supposed to but it is not meant to hold a growing a baby. baby absolutely absolutely so carrie what when you're talking to people with some tubal factor who are people that you encourage to consider iui so people who have certainly open tubes those are those are yeah, those, are those aren't the people we're talking about <laughs> those are the, that's the default but the people who have um a little bit more of the positive factors on their side so for example someone who's just looking for one kid and is still you know maybe in her early 30s 
where time is not immediately pressing and we have a little bit of time to essentially to screw around and to say, all right, let's try cheap and easy and see if it works. Because if it does, the payoff's huge. But if it doesn't, we still have time to, to move on to more aggressive treatments. Um, I think about people where we're looking at risk factors and we, we haven't really talked a whole lot about risk factors. So I'm going to take a tiny little diversion down, down this uh, road. When, when you're talking with your REI and we go through the 85 million questions that we go through because we are nosy, 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 nosy people. Um, and on a first date, we're going to ask all the things like, oh, how often do you have sex? And all of those things. Well, included in those questions are things like, have you had gonorrhea? Have you had chlamydia? Have you had pelvic inflammatory disease? Have you ever had endometriosis? Have you ever had surgery? Have you ever had a busted appendix? All of those types of things. You that smoke. Are, do you smoke? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, everything that we can possibly think of that's related to, is there some reason why those tubes would not be functioning well that may or may not show up on our testing? Because while it is really scary to have somebody go through treatment who has a known tubal abnormality, it's even scarier when they have an unknown tubal abnormality because we can mm -hmm. test whether the tube is open or not. We cannot test whether that internal architecture works. So if someone comes in and they said, oh yeah, I had, you know, chlamydia twice when I was like 18 and 20, and I have, I've maybe had a miscarriage or two since, but, um, it was too early to see anything in the uterus. We just, we had a positive pregnancy test and then it went down to nothing. Those are the people that start to give me a little bit of chest pain. And I make a note in my chart of, if this patient gets pregnant, you watch them like a hawk until you know that there is a baby growing in the uterus because those risk factors don't show up on the tests that we do. And so, so Carrie, what, what you're saying then is that patients like that sometimes can have an ectopic or tubal pregnancy, but it ends so early that they don't realize it. So they could even have two or three pregnancies. It's fresh off as a biochemical pregnancy and it's not yeah. like, oh yeah, well, it may have been a biochemical pregnancy in your tube. Well, and, and the other thing too, kind of to add to that is sometimes people can have, some patients can have a really good tube and they could have been pregnant before and could have had a pregnancy in the uterus, but still the other tube could be really bad for some other reason. And they just don't realize that. So those are the people that I think a lot of times tend to be like, oh, I'm, my tubes are fine. I don't need to, to test my tubes. And that's why we pretty much always say when you walk through our door, if you've not had your tubes tested by the time you see us, we want to test your tubes <clears throat> for that very reason. So one group of people that I tend to be more encouraged about are people who on HSG have what we call proximal occlusion versus dis distal occlusion. So what we mean by, so there's, there's a tight, there's a little bitty segment of the fallopian tube that has to go through the body of the uterus to get to the cavity of the uterus. Okay. And oftentimes during an HSG, you can have some cramping, which is essentially a contraction of that uterine muscle that could be occluding that teeny tiny space that the fallopian tube has as its kind of pathway. Okay. And so there's, there's a pretty high incidence of false positives on HSGs with those proximal occlusions and that if you had another HSG or if you had a laparoscopy and we put dye through your tubes later, um, that it would actually be open. Whereas if we see distal blockage, that is almost real always deal. real. That's the real deal. Yeah. There's there's nothing there that that causes blockage except for bad stuff. <laughs> Okay. Usually. Yeah. Usually. usually. And so if, if you, for me, if you have what we call unilateral blockage and it's proximal, I, I absolutely have an alert on your chart of, you know, ectopic precautions, but I'm, I'm much more open to proceeding with something non-invasive like IUI. Okay. So we've kind of talked about that. What are, what are some things that make you say, you know, I know I might be an option for you, but, but what are some things that kind of tilt you over into counseling that, that doing IVF may be the best thing in, in these particular scenarios? More than one ectopic is always top on my list because if you've had, certainly if you've had one, we worry, but certainly more than one, that's really mm -hmm. a big red flag that your tubes are just not good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Carrie, yeah. what the ever popular, if you are um, older or on one of those borderline ages and you want multiple kids for family planning purposes, um, you know, we want to do IVF because we want to bank uh, embryos so that 
we have those for the future. And then also looking at people who have had not just multiple ectopics, but multiple pregnancies of unknown location, like yeah. Susan was talking about earlier, those biochemicals, those really early miscarriages, mm-hmm. those things where we start to get that little icky feeling of, I wonder if those were normal pregnancies that just weren't making it to the location they needed to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So another group of people that I think of are, are people who have had surgery on their belly and they have documented scarring in their Mm -hmm. pelvis when we know how bad it looks in person, you know, if, if somebody tells us, you know, you have had a surgery and you have a frozen pelvis, which means you have so much scar tissue, nothing's moving around, or there was extensive scar tissue. Um, you know, we can't see that little micro architecture. Most of the time it's either your tubes are blocked or not. Once in a while, we have that beautiful SIN picture that gives us some information, but you know, if, if we know how bad things look on the outside of your fallopian tubes, we know that inside your fallopian tubes, it's, it's been a, it's been a pretty dangerous space. Mm -hmm, Carrie. Endometriosis tends to make me a little bit more inclined to go to IVF and Part of it is the reason of the scar tissue that can be in there. Part of it is the reason of just abnormal hormonal signaling um, when you have, especially like a big endometrioma, those types of things, even though the tube testing may be normal in what we can actually test and see, I find that a disproportionate amount of my endo patients end up in IVF. And I think at least a component of that is tubal issues. I don't know that that's the entire cause, but- I would say that I'm far more worried about the ability of the tubes to pick up the egg and move them along where they need to in endo patients than I am about any of my other, you know, subsets of types of fertility patients. Well, and that along endometriosis, along with just adhesions in general, you know, like you mentioned earlier, the tube being open is one part of it. But if the tube, if you think of the tube as like a vacuum cleaner that moves in the body cavity and sucks up the egg, you know, if it's tethered down, even if it's open, it can't move around to pick up the egg. So, you know, I think that's where the adhesion part really can make a big difference, even if the fallopian tube's open. So there's there's two groups of surgery patients that I particularly think of. Um, if you have had a ruptured appendix, so not a not ruptured appendix, those usually are fine. And those surgeries nowadays are pretty um, minimal adhesions and those types of things. But that ruptured appendix, all that nastiness in your pelvis, just Any kind of pus in your pelvis is bad. <laughs> exactly. In in people who had extensive bowel surgery as children. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's an, that's another group of people that like my little spidey sense is all over like, yeah. because it, it it's, it's, it's interesting because you can have some pretty extensive bowel surgery as an adult and it doesn't always have this type of situation. Mm-hmm. But if you've had a lot of bowel surgery as a, as a child, we, we tend to have, and it may be just because it's more likely due to inflammatory bowel conditions that have been very bad for a very long time period. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that that's contributing to a not healthy environment in your pelvis. And same with inflammatory bowel disease. So ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, mm-hmm. um, people who've had a lot of flare ups with that in their life. It's the same thing. Like the spidey senses start to go, oh, I wonder what's going on in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Anything else that you can think about on, on that decision-making factor of, of IUI versus IVF for tubal factor? No, but there's one key important thing, and you may be about to ask this question. If you do have a blocked fallopian tube, and we kind of alluded to this earlier, it pretty much, I think we would all agree, it needs to come out. And a lot of patients look at you like, well, why does this tube need to come out? I have another tube and I don't even need my tubes for IVF. And the answer is we don't really know for sure, but we think that that fluid that collects at the far end of that block dilated tube, if if it collects. So like Susan pointed out, there's block tubes or there's hydrosalpinges that are open, patent hydro, hydrosalpinges, and there's ones that are not patent. The ones that are completely blocked are the ones that we're real concerned about. So those need to come out. That fluid that collects at the far end of the fallopian tube, we think, can flush back into the uterine cavity it can either flush the embryo out or bathe the embryo in non-nutrient media. For some reason, it significantly drops your pregnancy rate. So even if you're young and healthy, you know, if your pregnancy rate is dropped by about 40%, that's really a big deal. So generally what that would mean for you is, yes, you would have to have laparoscopy. It is a surgery. 
somebody would have to go in and take that tube out. The good news is pretty shortly thereafter, we can get started with your IVF. So it really doesn't delay you by more than a month or so, but that tube definitely needs to come out before we transfer embryos. Now you, we can do an egg retrieval before we take the tube out, but before we put an embryo in you, we need to take that tube out. So I just want to clarify it, when Abby was speaking is, is I think she's really talking about those swollen fallopian tubes, the hydrocell pinks, not the just block. any block tube. Um, I, I don't, if it just happens to be blocked and I don't see a hydrocell pinks, I don't yeah. necessarily mm-hmm. remove Yeah, because it's, it's the fluid components. That the, if it's, the, if it's a hydro and it's open or closed, yeah, me, if in doubt, I'll, take it out. I will say if it's closed and we don't know for sure it's a hydrocell pinks, I always warn patients that sometimes as we start to stimulate you in the cycle, we may see that it fills with fluid. And if it does, that's our sign that it probably needs to come out. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. One group of patients that may be a little bit more, uh, maybe better served to go to IVF a little sooner is our patients who are extremely anxious and who have a very low tolerance for uncertainty. Because particularly when you're doing IUI in those early days, let's say you do the five week, five day ultrasound to cross check and see, do we have at least this, the beginnings of a sac in the uterus? You don't expect to see baby and heartbeat at that point, but at least do we have the sac and you don't see anything you then come back relatively short order to check again and then to check again and again and again. And we're doing lots of ultrasounds and lots of lab work. And there's nothing that's, you know, terribly hurtful, harmful, or invasive about it, but the emotional and mental psychological component of it with that uncertainty, some patients really, really struggle. And so there are some people that I can see from the very beginning, even though, they could, you know, they, they certainly have the option. Do they want to try IUI or not? They are already in a more delicate ups, you know, upset, fragile, fragile yeah. place. And so, whereas at one point in their life, they could totally tolerate this maybe right, right here, right now, today is not the time to do that. And so that's something to consider because that uncertainty, and it's usually, I don't know, maybe two to three weeks. It's not actually all that long, but it feels like for freaking ever when you were in the middle of it. Well, and one other corollary to that is, you know, like you said, I think that's a great group of people that would benefit from IBF. But as we all talk about, there's a big roller coaster with IBF too. And so for patients that have had a really rough patch, before you start IVF, I think we would all highly recommend that you seek out counseling from someone because it's you're going from one scary sort of uncertainty to potentially another scary uncertainty, although we feel more confident that you're going to get pregnant because we think there's probably a good chance that you'll have a good embryo, particularly in our younger patients. But it's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of fear. And sometimes that manifests differently in different patients. And, you know, we just we want you to be healthy physically and emotionally. And so it's probably a good idea to talk to somebody, um, you know, a religious leader, or psychologist, um, just to get some 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 ways to fortify yourself and help yourself get through all that. Absolutely. All mm-hmm. right. Great discussion. Great discussion. So to our audience, thank you so much for listening and tuning tune in next week for more. Um, please subscribe to our podcast, um, either on Apple Podcasts or your whatever venue you are um, working on. And we would love to um, see you and have you follow us and stay up to date on all things fertility. You can also visit us on fertility.stunts. Fertility.sensor.com. The cat's got my tongue today to submit specific questions. Um, we'll answer those on our Ask the Doc segment. And we also want to make sure that you remember and mark on your calendar October the 28th, we'll be in New Braunfels, Texas, the three of us, and hopefully a lot of other people. And we really would look forward to seeing you there and hope you'll make it. Um, and so um, let us know if you're going to do that. And we'll be happy to see you there. As always, this podcast is intended for entertainment and is not a substitute for medical advice from your own physician. So hit subscribe, mark your calendar for October 28th, and we will see you next week. Bye. Bye.